Hi everybody, I'm really excited to make this video because football is back. In this video, we're going to look at the management styles of English football's greatest league managers. And the managers we're going to be looking at are from today to, to historic managers from the past. Now, this is not a video about who's the best manager. This is a video of 12 of the greatest English league football managers and looking at their management styles and how they achieve success and how they motivate, motivated themselves and their players. For the video, I've chosen 12 managers managing in England. Now, the main criteria is that they must have won either the Premier League title or the old English Football League Division 1 trophy. The other criteria is that they must be post-war because managers pre-war have not much reference material on to do the research for this video and to comment on. My reference point started in November 1981 when watching my team, Blackburn Rovers. My football journey started in November 1981, when my dad and my granddad took me to watch my team, Blackburn Rovers, play Nottingham Forest in the Cup. It's quite a coincidence that two of the managers in this video were actually the managers on that night, so it's nice to have some personal reference points. In the video, I am trying to be objective and impartial, so whilst I am a Blackburn Rovers supporter and always have been and always will be, I have tried to be neutral and impartial and talk about the positives of these managers. These are people who achieve great success and that's why we're going to look at the management styles, see how you can apply your management styles, not necessarily to win football matches, but be, bring out the best in yourselves and succeed in life. Please everybody stay safe. EFL and Premier League football starts this weekend and the women's game started last weekend along with the international fixtures. So if we go to football this season, Please respect the social distancing. Please, everybody stay safe, whether you're going to football at home or going to work. And thanks very much for watching. Everybody who watches our videos, we really appreciate your time and we hope you enjoy this. Well, in London, England, name some brand, a uh, brand clough, some soccer player or something. Anyway. I heard all the way in America, I heard all the way in Indonesia that this fella talks too much. They say he's another Muhammad Ali. There's just one Muhammad Ali. And I want you to, whoever you are, you, you are not a fighter and you don't take my job. I'm the talker. Now, Clough, I've had enough. Stop it. <laughs> well, are you going to stop it? No, I want to fight him. <laughs> the administration at times, Brian? I always have and always will. Football directors are not one of my favourite hobbies. They act differently when they become football directors. They come on or into football when they are successful businessmen and all that type of thing. Sometimes they behave like idiots! And I'm sorry I'm shouting. Brian Clough, RBE, which many said stood for Old Big Ed, took two second-tier English clubs, Derby County and Nottingham Forest, to promotion, and then the First Division, now the Premier League, trophy. Famously falling out with the board at Derby County over them not wanting Clough to appear on TV as a pundit or contribute to newspaper articles, he sensationally quit and after a time at Brighton in 1974, spent 44 days at the then league champions, Leeds United, until sacked by the board. The one thing that separated this time at Derby and before that Hartlepool United with Clough's time at Leeds was the lack of his assistant, Peter Taylor. Taylor was inspirational in spotting talent, often outside of England's top flight, sometimes from non-league. And some of these players would later reach the highest levels of football success. There has been much written about Clough's short time at Leeds, but we must separate fact from fiction. With David Peace's controversial novel, The Damned United, is actually a fictional work, 
portraying Clough as an alcoholic on the brink of madness. Whilst the motion picture of the book shows a less controversial view of Clough, it should also be considered a work of fiction in my opinion. So whilst Clough's single-minded eccentric style was very much dictatorial, he relied in Taylor for his greatest successes. Together, they took Nottingham Forest from the second tier of English football to promotion and in their first season in the top flight, won the league. Qualifying for Europe, Forest won the first of their back-to-back European Cups. In the highly recommended documentary film, I Believe in Miracles, many Forest players commented on the lack of coaching and a unique trust in players led to success. This trust in players went hand in hand with Clough's dislike and distrust of football club chairman and the Football Association, the latter leading to the public referring to Clough as the best manager England never had. Despite applying for the job, interviewed by the FA twice, his criticism of the organisation is seen by many, plus Clough's will to take over and organise English football to be a major problem. After a parting of the ways with Taylor, Forrest achieved declining fortunes until in Clough's final season they were relegated in 1993 from the Premier League. I was at a match at the City Ground where my team, Blackburn Rovers, played Nottingham Forest. At half time, rather than talk to his players, Clough, increasingly in poor health, sat still in the Forest dugout, arms folded, completely motionless. Both the Forest and Blackburn fans started singing, There's only one Brian Clough, and they were right. is that you brought on all these incredible star players, Keane, Beckham, you know, Van Nistelrooy, and yet you fell out with all of them. Well, for those three, yeah. And well, I think I, Rooney, in a, in a sense. Yeah, I think you have to deal with issues others. as they come along. The side. Yeah. I never feel with Norman. Hints. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to deal with issues as they are at the time, and you, what I say is the most important thing, don't lose your control. Manchester United cannot afford players to run the football club. It's kind of, it wouldn't be Manchester United. And I say that time and time again to the directors over the years. So control is all? It's not all, but it's really, really important in terms of if you want to stay in a job, you need to have to control. Sounds a bit Stalinist. Oh, Jesus God. I know you're left of centre, but... <laughs> yeah, that's a bit extreme. What more can be said about Sir Alex Ferguson? But success came with an iron grip on his players and uncompromising attitudes to the game that did not make him universally popular. With breaking the old firm monopoly with Aberdeen in Scotland, Ferguson inherited a Manchester United side in 1986 he considered unfit and with a drinking culture. A rebuilding began. After mixed fortunes, and after building a new team containing new signings, Peter Schmeichel, Andrei Kanchelskis and Eric Cantona, added to the exciting youth talents of Ryan Giggs and League Sharp, Ferguson delivered United's first league title in 1993 for 26 years. He developed this team incorporating the legendary youth development system that not only developed Giggs, but David Beckham, Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes, Gary Neville and Phil Neville. There were tales about curtailing some of his younger players' social lives and Manchester football folklore talks about Ferguson having a network of spies to monitor his young players and him on occasion turning up at parties to enforce his rule and send his players home. This approach worked at Manchester United but many of Ferguson's players enjoyed long and successful careers. It's hard to see another manager 
enjoying more success over a long period of time as Sir Alex Ferguson. I was not satisfied with the results that we were getting. Wingers had scored very few goals at that particular time. And I think we must remember that Bobby Charlton was always considered a winger in uh, my early international days as the England team manager. Sir Alf Ramsey's success with England, with their only World Cup win, will rightfully overshadow the background to this sometimes tactically controversial and single-minded figure. After winning promotion, and league titles with Ipswich Town, Ramsey was selected to be England manager. He revolutionised the role, demanding he have complete control over the team selections, which in the past had been interfered with by committees. This led Ramsey throwing traditional football tactics in the bin for the 1966 World Cup, preferring attacking midfielders who can drop back two traditional wingers. After a slow start to the 1966 World Cup campaign, Ramsey held off great pressure to reinstate star striker Jimmy Greaves, who had recovered from injury. But this would change a winning team. His reputation is as a cold tactician, but his inclusion in this section is not just for the management of players, but for the management of the whole football establishment's and the media. There's no way anybody imitating can be great. If you want to do it, you've got to be yourself. If you, if you stray away from that line, there's nothing for you. You've got to be yourself. And, and if that at the end of the day is not good enough, then you, you've just got to accept that. I couldn't go on and say things or do things that Bill did, but I could do them uh, in a more cunning sort of way. Bob Paisley was the first managerial graduate of the famous Anfield boot room after the retirement of Bill Shankly as Liverpool manager. Paisley at first was reluctant to take the role, but with modest and quiet resolve built on the foundations created by Shankly. A one club man with Liverpool FC, Paisley had played for and had been physiotherapist and coach under Bill Shankly, and his background led him to bringing in increased player conditioning as a manager. This, plus an astute eye in the transfer markets, resulted in Paisley having more club success than any other English manager. A calm and quiet exterior hid a steely will to win. The easy-going manner endeared Bob Paisley to the whole football community. I think you've always got to be conscious of what you're saying publicly because it's a reflection on the club and everything that you do it reflects the club. I mean, it, if you do something good, it's good for the club. If you do it badly, it reflects badly on the club. So at all times, you're an employee, a football club, and that's got to be uppermost in your mind. Um, and that's, I'd rather be, be doing something properly for the club than do something badly. Another graduate of the Anfield boot room, Kenny Dalgleish was the most gifted of players who transferred his magic into management. On the field, not the fastest running, but the keenest footballing mind outwitted all opponents. In a glittering career, King Kenny won all major honours and took over the manager's role at Liverpool initially as player manager. Building on the success of Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley and Joe Fagan Dalgleish made the most astute signings of Peter Beardsley, John Barnes and John Aldridge. His affable quiet manner hid the sharpest of footballing minds that inspired the players that played for him. 
However, his place in the hearts of the citizens of Liverpool was cemented following the Hillsborough tragedy in 1989, where 96 Liverpool supporters died. Dalgleish was kingpin in supporting the emotional suffering of the ones the supporters left behind, and some say this led to his resignation in 1991. After a short time out of the game, Dalgleish was tempted back into management at second tier level at Blackburn Rovers. Supported by Rovers' greatest fan, steel magnate Jack Walker, Dalgleish broke the English transfer record twice with the signings of Alan Shearer and Chris Sutton. Yet it is misunderstood that Dalgleish bought his way to winning the Premier League in 1995. Yes, there was a lot of money spent, but this talent was mixed with homegrown talent such as Jason Wilcox and Mark Atkins, a central midfielder whose career was going nowhere in the second division, who Dalgleish turned from full-back to dynamic box-to-box midfielder, and also added to this West Ham veteran Tony Gale, who was signed not having a contract at the time. After his success at Blackburn, there are many stories of why Dalgleish resigned and became director of football. Some say he wanted to invest more to build a squad capable of winning the Champions League. But Jack Walker's dream of winning the Premier League was met. The story of Zinedine Zidane being at the Blackburn training ground and thinking of signing was met by Jack Walker's comment, Why do we need Zinedine Zidane when we've got Tim Sherwood? Dalgleish never reached the same managerial heights again with Newcastle United, Celtic and a return to Liverpool, but Dalgleish rightfully owns the title of King Kenny. You have to sacrifice your life for this job, because if you want to do it like I did until now for 30 years, without stopping ever, you have to prepare to work seven days a week and the whole year. Arsene who? Many people said when Arsene Wenger arrived in English football. They soon found out who he was. On his arrival at Arsenal FC, he inherited a drinking culture that had become the norm during a period of success, albeit with the Gunners' last league title five years ago. The Tuesday Club, as it was called, was some enthusiastic socialising amongst the players. Wenger's focus was on diet and conditioning, which was helped by the arrival of French players who did not have drinking culture in their game. An infamous story told by Arsenal midfielder Ray Parler was after an intense pre-season game, Wenger told the players they could go out. The French players could not understand why the English players were drinking beer, and the English players could not understand why the French players, who they spotted in a coffee shop, were smoking cigarettes. This restriction on diet and alcohol was allied to a studious approach to physical conditioning, where players had training regimes that matched their age and physical profile. But this approach led to players having the freedom to express themselves. Wenger also provided a holistic approach to play development, wanting players to develop as people and not just as footballers. Wenger has been a great project manager style football manager, delegating coaching work to his coaches whilst directing and observing. Off the field, Wenger was key in developing the club's training facilities and new stadium. Some say this was at the detriment to the investment on players and he stayed too long as manager. But it has led to the manager's role at Arsenal being elevated, not to just a leader of players, but a custodian of the whole football club. I think the game has lost a bit of its charm. A little happiness. I don't see a lot of people smiling at football today, players and directors and 
manage. I'm a director, my young. Of course. I'm get smiled. <laughs> but uh, I think that to some extent, unless a lad has scored a goal that they got and they go to the crowd, mm-hmm. I think they just lost a bit of the, the warmth of the game. Yes. You, you find you're referring the book to the, the quote, grim and smiling yeah. days of the 70s. And do you yeah, think it was really like that? I, I find it very much that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we used to play in well, years gone by, and we're not talking because we're old, much older, and much the game had happened yesteryear. Mm-hmm. But there was a warmth about it, and you played the game, and you tried to try to win. But if you win, you won. And if you lost, you accepted it. Mm-hmm. So Matt Busby was the ultimate father figure for a football club through triumph and tragedy. Building a great Manchester United team based on youth and players in their 20s, his Busby babes, as they were known, saw football change forever with the investment made in youth development and this became a cornerstone of future Manchester United success. In 1958, eight United players, three members of staff and eight sports journalists lost their lives when the aircraft they were travelling home in failed to get airborne at Munich Airport. Busby barely survived, and after a long recovery to health, he rebuilt a new Manchester United side, built on Busby's, and the other survivors that included Bobby Charlton and Bill Fox's grief. Busby believed that the game should be played in the right spirit, and this spirit led United to their first European Cup victory, in 1968, 10 years after Munich. When he retired in 1970 as manager, Busby has been criticised for staying at Old Trafford as director, overshadowing managers. But in hindsight, did his legacy lead successive United managers to have Busby as a safety net? However, Busby's legacy of promoting youth at United was repeated 40 years later when Alex Ferguson was told, the same as Busby, that he couldn't build a successful team based around youth. It was fitting that when United won their first league championship in 1993, their first since 1967, the celebrations fittingly focused equally on Sir Matt Busby, as much the incumbent, Alex Ferguson. I said that they were the most professional outfit in the business. And I said that in about 64, 65. And that word, they didn't take the word right, because professionalism meant that they wanted to train hard, they wanted to live right, they wanted to improve themselves, they wanted to be the best side in the world. Possibly the most controversial member of this list is Don Revy. But now different perspectives need to be considered away from him being the pantomime villain of English football. On his appointment in 1961 as the player manager of Leeds' third most popular sporting team after rugby league and cricket, Revit instigated a revolution that was decades ahead of its time, from changing the team's kit from blue and yellow to the Real Madrid-inspired all-white, to diet and conditioning, and to the best hotel accommodation for players on away trips. Revit instigated a united front at the club on all levels and created what was a family. He invested time in developing youth talent and extended his management into pastoral care, making sure players had settled and happy home lives off the pitch. This resulted in the players instilling a win-at-all-cost attitude and had an unswerving loyalty to their manager. Whilst the team gained a reputation as using foul play to win, there was a well-oiled football machine in operation that used craft as well as brute force. Having total control, obsession over research and dossiers of opposing teams gave a shared belief and a will to win at Leeds that led to unprecedented success. This technical approach was decades ahead of today's statistics-led management. This success led to Revy being chosen for the England manager's job, but he missed the day-to-day involvement in a team as an international manager. Some of the cosy social activities he enjoyed with his team at Leeds, such as bingo and carpet poles, 
did not translate well into an international environment. After little success with England, Revy resigned to become a manager in the Middle East. He was vilified for this and became a pariah of the English game. A reassessment of Revy though is needed and in Henry Winter's excellent book, 50 Years of Hurt, The Story of England Football in 2017, it is discussed that Revy had been told he was about to be released as England manager's job, so did the only sensible thing and actually look for a new job. But Revy's unbreakable bond with his players continued until his timely death from motor neuron disease in 1989, aged only 61. He's tight marked me for 11 months in my office and I think that he knows what the job's about and I think he's had a little bit of an apprenticeship and I hope he does well. well I'm, sure, I'm certain he is managerial. Uh, he has a managerial ability and whether or not, and I sincerely hope he does, uh, whether he becomes manager of Manchester City, we'll have to wait and see. Part of the Everton Holy Trinity of Kendall, Ball and Harvey, Howard Kendall was already an Everton legend by the time he became Everton manager in 1981. His managerial career, however, started in 1979, when he was appointed player manager of Blackburn Rovers, getting the Blue and Whites promoted from the old third division in his first season and nearly reaching the top flights of English football in his second. Being offered the Goodison job was too much for law, but the success was not instant for Kendall. His rebuilding process did not bring immediate results. Signing such key players such as Neville Southall, Trevor Stephen, Peter Reid and Andy Gray was key though to winning the first division title in 1985 and again in 1987, plus the FA Cup in 1984 and the European Cup Winners' Cup in 1985. This was not only a huge achievement but it broke Liverpool's dominance of English football. In 1987, following the ban of English footballs from European competition, where Everton would have been playing in the European Cup, Kendall left Goodison to manage in Spain. He returned twice more to manage Everton, but never recaptured the magic of his title-winning team of the mid-80s, when he built a team that was one of the finest of the decade. Kendall was playing in the very first match I watched in the early 80s a midweek cup match against Nottingham Forest, when he was player manager of my team, Blackburn Rovers. I was fortunate enough, a few years before he passed away, to have a chat with Kendall as he lived local to me. He shared a joke about Brian Clough managing the opposition, and his warm and friendly reputation was secured in my eyes. I'm a totally normal guy. I came from Black Forest. Um, um, my mother maybe sit in front of the of the television and, and watch this press conference and understand no word until now. So, and but it's very proud. She's very proud. So I'm a totally normal guy. Um, I'm the normal one, maybe if you want this. <laughs> yeah. Jurgen Klopp's heavy metal football brought a league title back to Anfield. The term heavy metal is brought from his team's high-intensity, counter-attacking type of play. Pressing high up the field, this Gengen press, counter-pressing football, sums up the heavy metal ethos. Fast and high-intensity, just like heavy metal music, Klopp's team's goal is for Gengen pressing to regain possession high up the pitch, exploiting open space and scoring. This counter-attacking style does not rely on keeping possession, but teams, teams fight for possession with wing-backs waiting to push forward. Organisation and concentration are needed for Gengen pressing, but this is a football philosophy driven by Klopp. The concentration, passion and will to win is shared by Klopp, who is worshipped by the red half of Liverpool.
please don't call me arrogant because what I, I'm saying is true. I'm European champion, so I'm not one of of the bottle. I'm a, I think I'm a special one. Jose Mario Dos Santos Mourinho Felix divides football opinion. He is the self-proclaimed special one, who is a serial winner of trophies. His winning is everything attitude is a pragmatic approach, and he prefers success over entertaining spectators. His playing career was modest, but was exposed to a great manager, working as Bobby Robson's interpreter at Sporting Lisbon and Porto, then later as a coach at Barcelona under Robson. The two men lived football and discussed its nuances until the early hours by all accounts. Mourinho the pragmatist can be a contradiction, both insisting that both success and failure are shared amongst the team and coaches, yet delivering a focus on individuals' talent. A clear vision has brought success, with his players knowing his expectations. His public persona is one of arrogance, but many closer to the man say he's warm and caring. One thing for sure is that his approach has brought success across Europe. Who's playing in front of the public is being well paid, and he doesn't dedicate himself to the job. I wouldn't. I would. I'd be hard on him. I'd, I would, if I could, I'd put him in jail. Out the road, in society, because he's a menace. Well, I think that if a, if a manager is honest and he has this natural enthusiasm, I think he, he whilst he can't go into the field with the players, he can convey it to the players. You understand? He's with them and they're with him. And they'll be successful. A manager who's, who's a manager and his, and his players are honest with, the, with him and they, he's honest with them, he can transmit his thoughts to them. And I'm certain I've headed some balls that have gone into the net. I've kept them out. Yeah. And I've scored a few goals as well. So that I've willed somebody to do something. And I've done it. Bill Shankly installed into his players that they play for the fans. There has never been a more charismatic manager in English football. An omnipotent character at Anfield. He ran the club and developed a dynasty in the boot room. After leaving school, Shankly worked down a coal mine until it closed and he was made redundant. He made his professional football career debut at Carlisle United, playing tough, high energy and simple football that was the mark of his later managerial career. After serving in World War II, at 33, Shankly's best playing days were behind him, but he ended his playing career at Preston, and then returned to Carlisle as manager. His managerial career led him to Grimsby Town, and then Workington, who were at the bottom of the Football League. He is Shankly led by example, carrying out many office administrative jobs as well as being the manager. Before he moved to Huddersfield Town as coach and then manager. He instantly saw a connection with the City of Liverpool when they offered him the manager's role. Shankly described the crumbling Anfield ground as the biggest toilet in Liverpool and built a club on and off the field, physically on the pitch and by improving the stadium and also emotionally with the red half of the city. His mark was on everything at the club, including changing white shorts for red, as he thought a whole red kit made the players look taller. This creation of a club culture and the legacy that will continue makes Bill Shankly one of the giants of the English game. No one can argue that Pep Guardiola is not a fine manager. But he's not including in this list, as I feel he has not achieved success without a large budget at the biggest clubs. Whilst a popular figure in the game, 
So Bobby Robson never won the English First Division League title or Premier League, so is sadly excluded. Whilst an innovator, Herbert Chapman belonged to another era. George Graham, another Arsenal legend, and Joe Fagan, who had been the fourth member of the famous Anfield boot room to be included, could have been on the list. But sadly, the list of names is finite. His international success with Ireland overshadows his domestic career as a manager. But like Sir Bobby Robson, Jack Charlton never won the English First Division title or Premier League. The final manager is Neil Warnock, a manager who revels in his public unpopularity. He holds the record for most promotions in English football, with eight, which warrants mentioning. <laughs>